Um, the title that I gave to Peter Stanley was not reading Charles Bean, but rereading Charles Bean, uh, which is as printed in the program. I began work on a doctoral thesis in February 1972, having completed my undergraduate studies in November 1971. In other words, I was highly inexperienced as a historian. Therefore, I was by no means an experienced historian when I began the task of researching and writing a 100,000 word thesis. I had learnt what most undergraduates would have learnt from four years of the detailed study of history. I had researched and written an honours thesis of about 20,000 words. You could say I had mastered the twin techniques of essays and exams, and that's about all you can expect from undergraduate teaching, I think. When I began my doctoral studies, I had never read in whole or in part any other historian's PhD thesis. And that strikes me now as really weird, um, that you'd embark on something like this for three years and not even know what others had done. I hadn't read them in thesis form, though I guess I had read a few that had been turned into books. So I had read books uh, at this stage of my intellectual development. I imagine I thought that writing a doctoral thesis would be like writing a book, which I had not yet done. More likely, I imagine, I thought writing a thesis would be like writing an essay, although much longer. I knew that I would not be required to use my greatest skill, which never was again used, which was a great shame, answering exam questions under exam conditions. This disappointed me, and if anybody would like to set me an exam paper, even now, I, I, I'd be happy to do it. I used to love exams. And when I taught undergraduates, I tried to interest them in loving exams, and it never happened. <laughs> Though I had a very distinguished historian, John Lanose, as my doctoral supervisor, he did not think it necessary, I imagine, to sit me down and ha explain how to go about researching and writing a thesis. Well, it wasn't his job. Though John had written a small pamphlet, Presentation of Historical Theses, Notes for University Students, MUP 1967, which no doubt I had read. But that was more about the writing of thesis, theses than the researching of them. In, e, indeed, in it, John had written, this presentation is not concerned, except incidentally, to tell students how to do historical research. So therefore, I wasn't getting much help from his uh, pamphlet, nor from his own personal discussion. Perhaps he thought I could find out um, how to do it for myself. Perhaps you had to, perhaps that's the only way to go. John did discuss, though, whether index cards were more useful to the researcher than a loose leaf notebook. And there may be some in the room who have even understood that last sentence. <laughs> to let you know how green I was, <clears throat> though, I had undertaken to write about the Australian churches in the Great War. I did not then know that in Canberra, where I had already lived now for four years, the Australian War Memorial had responsibility for the care and management of one of the largest and finest collections of material relating to the First World War anywhere in the world. K Professor Ken Inglis, visiting the ANU from Port Moresby, where he was Vice-Chancellor, shared that little secret with me. And I was not entirely to blame in not knowing that the AWM existed. Um, it was one then one of Australia's best kept secrets. And you can imagine the joy and delight when I got over there and discovered what we then called the library, and Peter Stanley would want us to continue to call the library, um, with this magnificent collection of materials uh, that was going to become important to me. So great tribute to Ken Inglis for letting me in on that secret. Fortunately, though, I was already familiar with the name of Charles Bean, the official historian. I must have become aware of him while I was studying Australian history as a third year undergraduate, but we most certainly did not study war in that survey course. In fact, in Australian universities at the time, it was thought somehow improper, possibly illegal, to study uh, Australian military history, uh, other than knowing that the Second World War had a big influence on the, on the working lives of men and women in Australia. So I made a neat linkage in the first weeks of my doctoral study, and this is where I want you to realise how absolutely talented I am at these sorts of linkages. War historian, topic related to war, read war historian. <laughs> 
That would look like research, I figured, which is what I was supposed to be doing. So every afternoon for several weeks, I wandered off to the Menzies Library, across the road from the Coombs Building, where I had my office at the ANU, took down from the stacks the volume of Bean I was currently engaged with, found my place, and continued reading. I imagine I took notes, but I can't find them now, and I don't usually throw things away. And I read and read. How long it took me to finish Bean, I cannot now tell you, but it must have been a couple of months. I had entered, I imagine, a rather exclusive club. Historians who have read the six Bean volumes of the official history of Australia in the war of 1914-1918. I also read Ernest Scott's Homefront volume, which in fact was of considerable use to me and would be my constant companion over the next three years or longer. Indeed, so that I could refer to it in my own room whenever I wished, John Lenoz had loaned me his own copy of Scott's volume. I still have it, though I must have offered to return it to Professor Lenoz when I finished my thesis because I think I was then an honest young man. Lenoz thought Scott's book a rather dull volume and he was glad to transfer ownership to me. At least that's how I hope it went. I mean, I hope I offered to give it back to him. The inscription on the book, by the way, says, for Emmy, who endured it while I wrote it. 28 February 1937, Ernest Scott's, first wife's, uh, Ernest Scott's wife's first name was Emily and they had married in 1915. My close reading of Bean contributed very little, I think, to the final shape and argument of my thesis, The Australian Churches in the Great War. I did not pick up from Bean, I only realised much later, just how tiny the Gallipoli battlefield is, though I did have my chaplains roaming freely, too freely, I now think, over that battlefield. I grieved at the death of, Cap of Chaplain Andrew Gillison on Gallipoli, of, rich, of which I must have read in v Bean, volume two, page 735, though the death only occurs in a footnote. Gillison died at Hill 60, and the military action there is described in great detail in Bean's Volume 2, including some of Bean's hand-drawn sketches of the terrain. Though in the thesis I called Chaplain Gillison one of the finest chaplains on Gallipoli, I only briefly mentioned that he had been killed, but said little about the manner of his death. In fact, he had gone out into no man's land to bring in a wounded Australian soldier who was lying out there calling out for help, despite being warned by soldiers in the vicinity that to go out there to get the wounded man uh, would almost certainly result in his death. And the sad thing is, I've never been able to find out who the wounded man was and whether or not he survived. But Chaplain Gillison and uh, a Methodist minister uh, pit and dry, who ha went out to help him, were both killed, um, were both shot, um, and, were, and uh, Gillison was buried on Gallipoli, and I go, when I take a tour there, I go often to his gravesite, and sadly it says, he's in the Embarkation Pier Cemetery, but gra sadly the headstone said, says, believed to be buried in this cemetery, so he, he was buried, and then the grave must have been disturbed in some way by, I don't know, shellfire probably. Um, and Bean, Charles Bean did not tell that story either in his footnote. When I turned to the Western Front in my thesis, I was more concerned with the things the chaplains were doing for the troops than the battles the troops were engaged in, or the places where they were living and fighting. In any case, the chaplains made up only two chapters in my thesis, so as I say, I do not think my close reading of Charles Bean was of great influence on the thesis that I wrote. Uh, and it's fair to say that there isn't much mention of Australian chaplains in the official history of the First World War, largely because, as I was told by uh, Bean's friend and uh, great supporter all his life, uh, Arthur Basley, that, uh, that Charles Bean had initially envisaged a, a, sole thesis, a, a, a sole volume, a standalone volume, on the work of the chaplains, and, he, and John Trelaw started collecting papers for that of which I was the great beneficiary, but that volume obviously never, never took place. Uh, and so probably uh, Bean didn't feel he needed to write much about the chaplains at the front because 
uh, he expected that that would be covered in a separate volume. And you could see where it would fit if, if that had been in his thinking. And, uh, uh, other people in the room, Michael Pickett or other more learned people than I, would probably be able to say, well, there's evidence of that in his thinking about the history, but I've never been able to find it. So I'm relying entirely on what Arthur Basley told me, that there was going to be a cha chaplain's volume. Because um, Basley was quite surprised to discover uh, all this material on the chaplains amongst Charles Bean's papers in the vault as they were then, where they were then held at the memorial and said they have nothing to do with Dr Bean, these papers, there, and gave them to me. <laughs> Well, um, that was a f that was a, a very important uh, fluke in writing a thesis. Um, what has stayed with me, though, from that reading, from that reading of the entire six volumes of Bean, as a member of that exclusive club joined in 1972, was one strong emotion. Bean gave me that emotion. It was an emotion of disgust at the reckless leadership of the AIF and the great sadness for the waste of life caused by those woefully inadequate leaders. I know this was an outcome of my first reading of Bean, because I know I told those with whom I was friendly or familiar at the time that Bean had given me a strong aversion to military leadership and that there would be no circumstance in which I would in ever entrust my life or the life of someone I loved into the hands of the military. I'm terribly sorry to have to say this in a military academy, but that was as Bean led me. This may not be as improbable as it now sounds. Born in 1945, I had entered the first ballot for the reintroduction of conscription in Australia in 1966. I won in that ballot that is, my birth date, was not drawn from the Tattersall's lottery barrel. I had given sworn court evidence in 1971 at a hearing to deter determine whether one of my closest friends could claim a conscientious objection to war. The magistrate found in my friend's favour, which was remarkable, in that my friend had no religious convictions which were the only grounds for conscientious objection to succeed under the act as it was written. And at morning tea or lunch, you can ask me how he got off when he refused to uh, take an oath on the Bible, but went for an oath of affirmation, which pr conclusively proved to the magistrate, Mr. Dobson, SM, uh, that he had no religious convictions, and yet he got off. Very tricky. Yet as most historians would now agree, Bean's criticisms of senior commanders, even at Fromel or Bulcor, where leadership was at its worst, is muted and his language restrained. In outlining the planning at Fromel, Bean uses expressions such as, it will be observed that this scheme was very different from that for which Haking had been asked to draw up plans or, or uh, um, elsewhere, it may be noted that this order cast aside the intention of secrecy. Or again, um, at this stage, the attitude of the British GHQ towards the projected offensive underwent a remarkable change. It is evident from the records of Haig's staff, far from pressing for the demonstration to be made, regarded its probable results with deep misgivings, and it seems certain that some members of the staff would gladly have seen the orders cancelled. Now, if you parse those um, remarks carefully, or not even that carefully, it will be observed, it may be noted, he is not demanding that the reader reach that conclusion, but offering the opportunity of reaching that conclusion. And it was the opportunity of reaching such conclusions that my reading of Bean had, had so impressed upon me. Thereafter, as he comes to a detailed description of the battle, the text is often limited to a half page only, or somewhat more, so that the extensive footnotes, mostly containing names and details of the dead, could be given the space they needed. And when I was reading Bean all those years ago, 
as a young man. It was that as much as the text which was overwhelming me. And so we often don't think deeply enough about the presentation of the official history as much as of the writing. And when you, um, if you're reading Bean consistently, it begins to horrify you. It's as if you're wandering down the Roll of Honour at the Australian War Memorial and looking at the names of all these dead. But Bean goes further than that, of course, because he personalises them. Perhaps it is not only Bean's words that outline the tragedy at Fromell, but the printing and presentation of the book, with a virtual Roll of Honour accompanying the account, the account of the battle. Page 369, footnote 79, is an example. Listing officers killed from the 53rd Battalion, Bean gives 11 names and continues. Paulin was of Goulburn, New South Wales. Allen, law clerk of Bondi, New South Wales. Collier, solicitor of Roseville, New South Wales. Moffat, accountant of Gisborne, Victoria. Mudge, tailor of Perth, Western Australia. Nelson, theatrical treasurer of Neutral Bay, New South Wales. Noble, blacksmith of Wollongong, New South Wales. Pratt, clerk of Northbridge, New South Wales. Page after page after page. And uh, it was the same when Bean writes about Bulcor. Soon again, the text gives way to long footnotes, another virtual role of honor. See volume four, pages 299 and 300, for example. Bean concluded his 120-page account of the Battle of Fromelles with these words. The verdict of the military student will much more probably be that the well-known difficulties of a narrow-fronted offensive in trench warfare had been too lightly faced. He concedes that the fifth, quoting, the fifth Australian division was crippled by the fight at Fromelles and not until the end of the summer did it regain its full self-confidence. Well, whatever of the verdict of the military student, um, this student knew he would never allow himself to surrender control of his life to a modern day equivalent of General Sir Richard Haking, if any such man could be imagined. So that was my first reading of Bean. But my topic this morning invited me to tell you of my rereading of Bean. But it is my suggestion that on the whole, we do not reread Bean. Are men and women, students of history or otherwise, still, still joining the exclusive club today that I joined all those many years ago? I think not. I once lost a bet to the then Director General of the National Library when I said I'd take to lunch, a good lunch, anybody who could convince me that they'd read all the operational volumes of the official history of Australia in the Second World War. And Warren Horton ran me up and said, when I was a young librarian at the State Library of New South Wales, with very few clients in the evening, I read the whole lot, so when are we going to lunch? <laughs> I'd never envisaged that you could use official history in that sort of way. Yet Charles Bean's fame, so I, I was saying, um, I, I don't think too many people would join that exclusive club now. Yet Charles Bean's fame has never been greater. The subject of several recent films, documentaries and dramas, and two recent and highly acclaimed biographies, the Bean story should by now be quite well known. While I liked the portrayal of Bean in Deadline Gallipoli last year, it made me wonder, perhaps more than any other portrayal, whether it is possible to capture his personality in any form, in any context. That, though I must say, the photograph that we've been given this morning uh, uh, as a, uh, on our conference brochure um, is one I hadn't seen before, and it's a really, really interesting <coughs> photograph, isn't it? It's uh, well done to whoever found it and, and used it. He intrigues those of us who come to know a little of his life, and his best-known quotes spring readily to mind. On writing, for example, he determined never to write a sentence which could not be understood by a housemaid of average intelligence. Or on sorrow and loss, as for example at Fromell, when Elliot came round, I felt almost as if I were in the presence of a man who had lost his wife. It's absolutely beautiful, isn't it? 
um, or on religion. I am not a religious man. I don't know that I bear any allegiance to the Christian faith. And yet, of course, his father uh, was a clergyman. And so on. Charles Bean lived a quiet and scholarly life, cared for by a wife whose devotion knew no limits and who was prepared to fight for him right up until the time he died. And I was given the task, uh, a delightful task last year, of going through his repatriation file and seeing just how Mrs. Bean uh, fought for him uh, when he had become uh, very unwell at the last part of his life. And as Peter said, I, I knew Mrs. Bean quite well, which was a great privilege, and from her felt I had some connection at least with Charles Bean. But it is his history that has kept his name alive. We now know what a struggle it was for Bean to find the right tone, the right voice, and how carefully he maintained that voice throughout. He wrote at very great length, too long, thought Australian Treasurer and later Prime Minister Ben Chifley, who counselled with spectacular lack of success the second official historian, Gavin Long, not to do a bean and to keep it short and sharp. That has not been the tradition of Australian official military history. Writing of one of Long's team, David Dexter, recently for the Australian Dictionary of Biography, I discovered that Dexter, quote, Con and this is Dexter's own words, consciously adopted the method of the first official historian, Charles Bean, when writing his own official history, by gathering all his materials into six master diaries. Then, like Bean, Dexter wrote through the night long drafts which he circulated wildly, widely, like Bean, pr to produce an 851-page book on the New Guinea campaign, of, uh, the New Guinea offensive in the latter part of the war. Bean's histories sold in respectable quantities as they were published, largely because of John Trelaw's imaginative and successful direct debit scheme for federal public servants. Angus and Robertson could not find a market for the books, and although the books continued to carry the firm's name on the spine, throughout the series they were, in fact, published by Trelaw at the Australian War Memorial. That institution arranged for the reprint in hardback and paperback of the entire series, with the exception of the photographic volume, by the University of Queensland Press in the 1980s. I suspect the UQP reprint sold more strongly than the original publication, in any case, Laurie Muller, the general manager of UQP, seemed quite pleased with the outcome, although he declined to bid for the reprint of the Second World Series when that was offered to him. The Australian War Memorial, hoping to expand the readership of both Beans and Long series in the new century, allowed both series, all series in both histories, to be digitised and to be placed on the memorial's website. I'm not in a position to know how many hits the histories attract on a daily basis, perhaps you know. Um, but the, when I clicked onto Trove early in the morning I was writing this paper, I noticed that 9,628 readers had joined Trove in that hour. By midday, Trove would expect to have well over 20,000 readers for that day, so far for that day. A figure, I'm sure, that it, is not in any way expected of the readers of the digitised official history. While it is excellent that a reader anywhere in the world now has access to Bean's and Long's history, I am not sure that the digitisation of their works has worked to the historian's advantage. Like most of those who use this online service, I go to the AWM official history website when I want a quick fact from Bean. It's easier to read a dozen or so pages of Bean on Fromell, for example, at my computer than it is to pull the book down from the shelves. But the online version does not encourage browsing, and I could not imagine any person reading an entire book online, an entire Bean book online, let alone the entire series, but I'd be happy to be proved wrong. Over the years, on many battlefield tours, I have concluded the tour, often at Bell and Glees, at the fourth Australian Division Memorial, the most remote memorial of them all, reading aloud the last words of Charles Bean's magnificent history. What these men did, nothing now can alter. The good and the bad, the greatness and the smallness of their story will stand. Whatever of glory it contains, nothing now can lessen. It rises as it will always rise, above the mists of ages, a monument to great-hearted men, and for their nation, a possession forever. <laughs>
It is a magnificent conclusion to Charles Bean's lifetime's work, which too is for our nation a possession forever. As is probably well known now, these words at the very end of his monumental history were among the first words Charles Bean wrote as he set out on his task in 1919. It was the spirit embodied in those words which he hoped would animate the entire work. Charles Bean has given us a resource, especially in the digital age, which will continue to be used and to be mined. I do not think it really matters if people sit down and read him cover to cover. To do that a second time in one lifetime, to reread Bean's entire history again, might be a little excessive. Am I on time? Absolutely. Thank you. Just the mention of losing his bell from Spear. I know it's a isn't it? Let's do a Frank Sinatra. You hold. Oh, do it your way. No, it's all right. Um, we have ten minutes for questions, discussion, commentary, and challenges. Who's going to hear the question on the table? Uh -huh. Hello, it's Gina Ryman. I, I was just asking whether you think Bean's disillusion of the religion was a result of what he'd seen? <laughs> or um, did he have that sentiment before he became destroyed? Yeah, um, it, 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 it can't have helped. What he saw on the Western Front particularly can't have helped him. Though both on Gallipoli and on the Western Front, one of his closest friends was um, Walter Dexter, the father of David Dexter, the Second War official historian. And he was a great admirer of some of the very great chaplains, the, um, the Salvation Army officer, William Mackenzie, uh, the uh, Catholic priest from Perth, John Fay. So personally, he, he had a, an affection for men of spirituality seeking to assist men of, of pro pro possibly not too much spirituality. In, in the book that came out of the thesis, I described how a man went to a chaplain and said he was slightly um, disturbed that his thinking now was that shooting Germans was not much more difficult than shooting rabbits and he wondered whether this was an entirely appropriate uh, thought to have and the chaplain sought to convince him that it was an entirely inappropriate thought and that shooting men is not the equivalent of shooting rabbits. And Bill Gamage uh, reviewed the book in historical studies and said what harm that chaplain was doing to soldiers, what great harm he was doing by showing them that what they were doing was against the teaching of Christ and their religion. And, and Bill's right, and, and I, I think Bill's right anyway, and I think that Charles Bean would have probably reached that conclusion too. But what we'll never know about Charles Bean is that intimate, that intimate nature. He would never have it's remarkable that he would write. I don't know that I've had any, you know, any adherence to religion, because that's revelatory, which is so rare in his in his in his writings. But um, uh, his 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 response to the war was to to use the history and the war memorial to remind Australians in perpetuity of what sacrifice had been done in their name and to ensure, as we know, both he personally and in any ways he could officially, to ensure that the, those who remained alive, the children of soldiers who'd given their lives and the wives, were properly cared for and looked after by Australia. Um, uh, but that, that doesn't speak of the necessi necessity sorry, of religious faith. Australian, um, Australian military during the First World War may bring to his own sources? Uh, yeah, well, um, he is a, an invaluable source. Um, there was a period 
um, when it was to to totally unfashionable to study the story of Australia in the First World War. And to many people in this room, that might sound um, strange because um, First World War studies in Australia are extremely healthy and strong and books continue to be produced all the time. But Charles Bean, I mean, when Bean offered to Trelaw to write the short history, his short history of the First World War, Anzac to Amiens, Trelaw sought to discourage him, saying there simply wasn't a market for such a book. Um, so that would have hurt him, I would think, having given so many years of his life to writing the, the big books and then correctly wanting to boil it down so that the readers who couldn't commit all that time and effort to reading the whole thing would get a good solid account of, um, of the war but in much shorter time frame for, in terms of their readership. So he would have known um, in the 1950s that the First World War did not rate very highly with Australian historians. Um, and one of the reasons I found myself working at the War Memorial um, so many years ago was um, I was at a conference that was meant to kick off one of the volumes of the Bicentennial History Project, which was being done by historians from all around the country to celebrate Australia uh, 1988, 200 years of Australian history. And I went to the conference at the University of Sydney um, to discuss the volume, the last volume in what was called the Slice Volumes, 1939 to the present. And it was announced right at the beginning, right at the start of the conference, by the two people who had been chosen to be edit uh, editors and writers of that volume, that they would not look at in any way at all the story of Australia in the Second World War. And I thought to myself, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. You're writing a book about <coughs> Australia from 1939 to 1988, and you're going to knock out six years, which sets the whole tone for the rest. And, and, it just, and so I, I got talking with a fellow I, I happened to know as a member of the Council of the Australian War Memorial, Professor Brian Gandivia, who was at my university. And through a long series of strange events, I found myself working at the War Memorial. But, so what you have to understand in, in response to your question is it been got lost for a long time. And I do think the digitization has been incredibly important in allowing people to access him, but not everything, just you know, cle cleverly and carefully. Um, and uh, he will be used forever. And he, he, he is a possession of the nation forever. Craig Yes, my name's Craig Wilcox. Thank you for... Hello, Craig Wilcox. Um, it strikes me that you are reading being across, well, across several chasms, um, and a couple yes. of you haven't mentioned. One is in the wake of the turmoil and insensibility that comes from the 1960s, and another is a possibly religious one in another sense that you were raised, I understand, in the Catholic tradition. B was, might not have been a Christian, but he was certainly an Anglican. <laughs> yes, yes. And, 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 and those are great yeah. differences to have navigated. Did they strike you at the time, or am I making too much of them in thinking that did, did, does our beings work go in and out of comprehensibility? If I can make a word like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or it, 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 what, yeah no, I'm, I'm just struggling now. Mm. Was it um, harder, harder in some ways to, to reach Bean and find his wavelength, or is there something about the mastery of what he did, that it didn't strike you as foreign, strange, outdated, different. It certainly didn't strike me of uh, any of those things you've just mentioned, Craig. It didn't strike me as strange, outdated at all. It struck me as remote um, and hard to read, without any coming at it without any background at all, bearing in mind that you know, I had never studied war, but you're quite right to emphasize that anybody who w was born between 1945 and let's say about 1954-55 was going to be thinking very carefully about war and the likelihood of being at war because we were all um, able to be conscripted. And as I said, I missed out, but my younger brother didn't. And I was living on a campus which was a quiet, small 
a shy campus, the ANU, but even there, protests about the war were very frequent and very moving. And one of the most moving um, protests, I've never sort of admitted to this because I did work at the War Memorial for a while, one of the most moving protests we had was on the foreground right by the Stone of Remembrance on the parade ground at the Australian War Memorial and let's say by that stage 389 Australian soldiers had been killed in Vietnam. Well his name was read out and a member of the student body moved from one side of the parade ground to the other to show the extent of the loss of life. And it was a very moving protest, very quietly done and, and so on. And so that was in the forefront of our thinking. So clearly I came to Bean with an understanding of the horror of war. And as people would say, and as Peter Edwards would know better than anyone, everyone in Australia was getting their understanding of that war from their television screens, which for that that was for the first time. Therefore, you ca I came to Bean in a way that Second World War readers who had fought would have, but very few others would be thinking about war. And it wasn't taught in universities. It wasn't taught in schools. You came to Bean then with absolutely no background. Nobody who decided to sit down and read all of Bean now would come with no background. They would have read Peter Stanley. They would have read, you know, Mark Johnson. They would have read a huge number of, of people. Peter Burness, you know, everybody in the room would be able to say what they brought before they tackled Bean. And that wasn't the question. To the, the second answer, and he's going to ring that bell, so I'll have to stop. The, uh, to coming to the second point, it never occurred to me that there was a religious divide uh, in, in, reading, in reading Bean. It seems to me that he is so even-handed in relation to the, the people he, he is writing about, and he makes nothing of the very evident and obvious religious divisions in the AIF. We now know what a very small majority of officers in the AIF were Catholic. And we now know um, what a substantial number of men in the ranks of the AIF were Catholic. Um, uh, uh, he let Ernest Scott, to be honest, he let Ernest Scott get away in the home front volume with some significant anti-Catholicism in his treatment of Mannix. And I would have reacted to that because in my family, in, in my community, Mannix was, was the great hero. And I would have reacted negatively to that. But I wouldn't have seen Bean as doing that because I wouldn't have known at the time that Bean was the editor and probably a substantial writer of the home front volume. But that wouldn't been, would never have, I'm, I'm surprised that he allowed Scott to be so um, cre trenchantly critical of Mannix's religion, not what Mannix did in relation to conscription, but Mannix's religion. And, um, and probably he was a bit scared of Scott, but others would know more about that than I. But I think by the time he had to get the home front volume out, he'd had such disasters in getting it out that I think he thought, well, if I, if I knock him off too, uh, it's just going to be a fast. So, but that's the only thing I'd say. And I never brought any um, sense to reading Bean that I was entering alien, uh, alien religious territory. Not at all. But probably I should have. Thank you. And thanks for all the questions. Can I invite you to thank Michael for the wonderful first